This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Rescuers in Indonesia racing to find and pull out survivors after powerful earthquake kills dozens. African Union urges member states to place COVID-19 vaccine orders after deal with manufacturers. And Ugandan President Yuweri Museveni takes early lead in presidential race as vote counting continues. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us on Richard and Ta Live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. And tonight, I'm alongside my colleague Uche, who has our business headlines. Uche. Thank you, Richard. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Bits. Ratings agency Moody's projects Ghana's GDP will grow by 4% this year. And U.S. President-elect Joe Biden unveils a $1.9 trillion stimulus package proposal. Of course, all that coming up within the program. For now, it is back to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Uche. Once again, welcome to Africa Live. So good to have you with us. I'm Richard and Ta. Let's begin in Indonesia, where rescuers are racing to find survivors from a powerful earthquake. At least 42 people have died, but authorities worry that the number will rise as they assess the full-scale of damage from the 6.2 magnitude earthquake. It rocked the island of Sulawesi early Friday. Crews are digging through the rubble, trying to find people trapped in collapsed buildings, including a hospital. Authorities worry there could be aftershocks, possibly stronger and strong enough to trigger a tsunami. Officials have mobilized helicopters to bring in aid and evacuate victims. Sulawesi was hit by a huge quake and tsunami just two and a half years ago that killed thousands of people. And let's turn our attention to Uganda where vote counting continues in a hotly contested national election. According to the Electoral Commission, pre preliminary results show longtime leader Yuri Museveni taking an early lead in the presidential elections. The commission said that with 29.4 percent of votes from Thursday's ballot counted, Museveni had won 65 percent of the votes while the main opposition candidate, Bobby Wine, had 27 percent. The normal, normally bustling capital, Kampala, was quiet on Friday, made a public holiday after Thursday's poll. There are about 18 million registered voters in the country. The Electoral Commission is expected to announce final election results Saturday afternoon. While Friday marked the last date for U.S. troops withdrawal from Somalia, Around 700 U.S. troops have been helping Somalia battle al-Shabaab militants and prepare Somali forces to take over security operations once regional forces depart. The U.S. troop withdrawal was ordered by President Donald Trump at the beginning of December last year. There have been fears that their exit could leave Somalia vulnerable to a resurgence of al-Shabaab and Islamic State militants. The U.S. says it will continue to conduct counterterrorism operations outside of Somalia. All right, the World Health Organization Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus is uh, right now giving an address in relation to COVID-19. Let's take a listen. All right, moving on, we, we shall follow that in a in a few moments, we're still waiting for more information on that. But moving on, the African Union is asking African countries to uh, sign up to acquire COVID-19 vaccines through a deal it has reached with three manufacturers for 270 million doses this year. The AU wants member states to put their requests through an online platform. Coletta Wanjohi spoke to the director of the AU's Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. John Kingasong. The African Union is aiming to immunize at least 60% of the continent's population against COVID-19 in order to achieve herd immunity. 270 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines will be bought from three manufacturers, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. The first batch of 50 million will arrive between April and June this year. Countries should now take on this. It is the ball is in the camp of the countries to 
uh, engage and, and start placing their, their orders, okay, so that we can actually know the volumes that are, are, have been uh, 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 pre-ordered, and then the Afri Exim Bank can engage with this the manufacturers and do the, the, the payments. A Frexim bank will make an advance commitment of up to $2 billion to the manufacturers on behalf of the countries. Individual countries will then agree with a Frexim bank on how to pay back for what they have ordered, either through their own resources or through a payment facility that will have them spread out installments over five years. The World Bank is also offering about $5 billion either for countries to buy more vaccines or pay for delivery of vaccines committed by a Frexim bank. The Africa CDC says this should help countries prepare for vaccine rollouts. Especially also given that the World Bank is we're talking to countries and making available resources for to be used for vaccination and not just procurement of vaccines. So the opportunities are out there uh, for uh, this accelerated preparedness to occur. It shouldn't be a complex exercise at all. I think if you remove the whole uh, thinking of a coach, a ultra coaching, which I'm um, I don't think I, 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 I subscribe to that. Uh, then it becomes a, 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 a logistic uh, a, a arrangement that is very, very within reach of our capabilities as, as a continent. Distribution of the acquired vaccines will be highly dependent on individual member states, but guided by a strategy from the Africa CDC. We need to uh, also factor the, the fact that 80% of, uh, of our economy is informal and say, okay, how do we expand these vaccines to... Uh, to uh, uh, the informal sector, like um, the young people that are out there hustling to earn a dollar or two a day and uh, with uh, all the motorbikes, the bus drivers and others. So that's why the community engagement component is so important so that uh, the, the vaccines become available and there's also willingness to uptake those vaccines. This new acquisition complements the approximately 600 million doses the continent will receive from the COVAX facility. The global scheme aims to immunize 20% of the continent's population. And while Africa has not yet secured enough vaccine supply to cover its 60% immunization target, the journey towards mass inoculation is getting underway. Koleto Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Let's turn our attention uh, to Ethiopia. The United Nations has reported that hundreds of thousands of people are yet to receive assistance in the northern Tigray region. The Ethiopian government said it is working with aid agencies to provide assistance. However, the UN has expressed concern over the lack of access to some areas, including refugee camps. Here is CGTN's Gurum Chala with more. The conflict in Tigray has left millions in need of life-saving assistance. That includes food, water, shelter and medical services. However, many say the humanitarian situation in Tigray still needs due attention from all involved in relief services delivery. Hundreds of thousands are said to be in urgent need of basic supplies, including food. Making matters worse is the situation in the already existing refugee camps of the Tigray region where Eritrean refugees reside. There too, all kinds of relief services are needed and as soon as possible. Ethiopian authorities say they are engaged in a successful delivery of aid to Tigray. That work is being done alongside the United Nations aid organizations and the Red Cross. Also, the government says it's a task of rehabilitation and reconstruction of Tigray after the end of the war is ongoing. However, Ethiopia still needs more global support to address its humanitarian challenge in its northern territory. Group Dalla CGTN, Risaba, Ethiopia. The United Nations is warning that 7.5 million people, or two thirds of the population in South Sudan, will face acute food shortages this year. Heavy rains and seasonal flooding since July last year have adversely affected more than a million farmers, resulting in widespread damage to agriculture and property. CGTN's Patrick Oyet brings us this report. Heavy rains and seasonal flooding since July last year have adversely affected more than a million farmers, resulting in widespread damage to agriculture and property. We are suffering. We run away from flooding, but here we need water, we need food, we need places to sleep. We've lost everything because of flooding. We've left our homes that we built, and here there are no tents for some of us to sleep. 
Once farmers, these displaced people are now entirely reliant on food aid and with no farm tools and no land, they are unable to change their situation. The community owning the land where the displaced are settled says they are unwilling to lease their land either to the government or to the displaced, fearing that once they lease the land, its ownership may not be granted back. There are a number of cases of land conflicts in the country. The United Nations is warning that food aid will be needed for the next three months at least. As these displaced people have no other options, the government says it is working to address the situation. We have difficulties in terms of raising funds, enough resources, either by the international community, either by the government, in order so as to address the humanitarian needs in this country. And Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs is doubling it for trying what it could do in terms of response. The UN says of the people affected by the acute food shortage, 1.4 million are children who will suffer malnutrition. It is urging international donors to provide the necessary funds to try and address the situation. Patrick Oyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. At least 46 civilians have been killed and several others injured in an attack by armed men in the northeast of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Authorities in Ituri province say the victims of the attack all belong to the Pygmy ethnic group. Chris Ochamringa has that report. The attack happened on Thursday in Masini village in the DRC's northeastern province of Ituri. A group of armed men raided the village and killed 46 pygmies with machetes and guns. A woman and a two-year-old child survived the attack. They sustained serious injuries but are now receiving treatment at a nearby health facility. The Congolese army says it has deployed troops to pursue the armed men whose identity they have not yet established. But a local NGO has blamed the attack on rebels of a notorious group in eastern DRC called the Allied Democratic Forces. Residents of the area have called on the government to reinforce the security in their area. Hundreds of people were killed in the area last year and thousands others displaced after fierce fighting broke out between fighters of the Lendu and Hema ethnic groups. The east of the DRC has more than a hundred armed groups fighting over land and mineral resources. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. All right, let's revisit our uh, st a story earlier that we tried to bring to you. The World Health Organization Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus is right now giving an address in relation to the COVID-19. Uh, let's take a listen. Put a major emphasis on rolling out COVID-19 vaccines equitably. Health workers are exhausted. Health systems are stretched and we're seeing supplies of oxygen run dangerously low in some countries. Now is the time we must pull together as common humanity and roll out vaccines to health workers and those at highest risk. This is key to saving lives, protecting health systems and driving a fair recovery. We have also developed updated guidance about how to best protect people in long-term care facilities and recognize that if they are isolated, it has a profoundly negative impact physically and mentally. The guidance aims to prevent the COVID-19 virus from entering the facilities and ensure our loved ones remain safe. I was really pleased to see refugees in Jordan start to be vaccinated this week. I truly appreciate the approach taken by the Jordanian government to ensure that refugees are not left behind. It's critical this momentum on equitable vaccine rollout continues in the weeks ahead. I came into public health because I wanted to ensure that everyone everywhere has access to quality health services. I know what it's like to come from a continent where not all health services are available. When AIDS drugs first rolled out, 
they were only available in, right, in rich countries until a historic movement of health advocates, civil society, and manufacturers provided a rollout of low-cost antiretroviral drugs. In the H1N1 pandemic, by the time low-income countries received vaccine supply, the pandemic was over. We don't want this to be repeated. COVID-19 vac vaccines are a major scientific breakthrough, and I know through COVAX that we will distribute them a lot more effectively than in the past. We're working hard, but we must also do more to ensure that vaccines reach those that need them most. I will keep repeating this over and over again during the coming weeks. Because, as I said on Monday, I want to see vaccination underway in every country in the next 100 days so that health workers and those at, at high risk are protected first. I'm looking forward to the executive board next week and working with manufacturers and countries to ensure that vaccine supply is available and distributed equitably around the world. I now want to turn to the chair of the emergency committee, Professor Didier. All right, that was uh, Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus briefing us on uh, COVID-19. Time now for a short break. Here's a look at what's ahead. Travelers via land encounter lengthy jams as South Africa closes borders. And talks between Indian government and farmers remain deadlocked as government refuses to scrap new agricultural laws. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Syria, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. about your life at that no. particular time? Not at all. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to pie itself. Excuse me. <laughs> Welcome back to Africa Live. Thanks for staying with us. A force commander of the UN peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic, General Daniel Siddiqui Trare, visited checkpoints after rebel forces launched an attack near the capital. The incident happened on Wednesday, leaving one Rwandan peacekeeper dead and another injured. The dawn attacks targeted two army brigades but were repelled by security forces after intense fighting. At least 30 rebels were reportedly killed while others were arrested. The attacks were the latest after rebel groups vowed to march on the capital to prevent a poll in December that saw the re-election of President Fawson Archanja Toadera. Force Commander Trari says that for now, life is returning to normal in the capital. 
que la population a repris ses activités ici. From the behavior of the population, I see that the people have resumed their normal activities here, thanks to the operations which were carried out yesterday in response to the rebel group's incursion attempt in Bongi. However, through the vigor, robustness and determination of our troops, it is here that the insurgent elements were able to be stopped and therefore we were able to contain them. Les premiers éléments ont pu être arrêtés et donc on a pu contenir. People are dying. There's a famine and we have no medicine. We have suffered too much. Currently, people have fled and have taken refuge on the other side. May God support me, Russia has announced that it's pulling out of the Open Skies Treaty. Moscow points to Washington's withdrawal last year, saying it seriously compromised the agreement. The pact allowed member countries to conduct unarmed surveillance flights over military facilities. The U.S. left the treaty in November, accusing Russia of violating it, something Moscow denies. Nearly three dozen nations signed the treaty, which came into force in 2002. Russia will formally notify other members about the exit process, which usually takes months. Well, talks in India between the government and farmers remain deadlocked. The government is refusing to scrap new agricultural laws, which the farmers say will benefit large corporations. Both sides have agreed to resume talks next week. This is the ninth round of discussions over the long-running dispute. Tens of thousands of farmers have been camping on the outskirts of the capital, New Delhi, in protest for more than a month. This week, India's Supreme Court delayed implementing the controversial laws and ordered more negotiations. But farmers insist they won't leave until the government repeals the reforms. Leisure travel via roads from South Africa's neighboring countries will have to be put on hold until February. Lengthy queues at many land borders prompted the closure of several ports of entry. South Africa has, been a has seen a phenomenal spike in coronavirus cases and is desperately trying to control the second wave through tighter restrictions. CGT and Julie Shire reports. With 20 South African land borders closed, general travelers from neighboring countries will be barred until the 15th of February. People will, however, still be allowed to enter or depart the country for the following purposes for the transportation of fuel, cargo and goods, emergency medical attention for a life-threatening condition, the return of South African nationals or permanent residents or persons with other valid visas, diplomats, the departure of foreign nationals, daily commuters from neighboring countries who attend school in South Africa. Ramaphosa expressed concern over snaking queues with many returning after the festive season. This has exposed many people to infection as they wait to be processed and it has been difficult to ensure that the health requirements for entry into South Africa are met, with many people arriving without proof of COVID-19 tests. Long-distance truck drivers caught up in the commotion waited days to get through the South African border posts. So we get stuck there. We spend more than two days or three days to cross over. Then even to come back the same. All the liners are busy. We try to use our mask all the time. Then we stay on our trucks. We are not combined with many people. Ramaphosa's decision has been welcomed. During the year, the border is not, the border's not so much busy. But the end of the year, like the December time, people that are traveling home, they're going to enjoy the holidays, the, the border's more busy. So that's why the president tried to, to, to cross, close the border so that everyone can be safe. Tighter restrictions may have somewhat eased congestion for now, but officials still have their hands full at some ports with desperate attempts at illegal entry. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. University lecturers in Nigeria have refused to resume academic activities, saying insufficient COVID-19 protocols have been put in place. Now, what's, what's more, lecturers at public institutions only recently reached a settlement with the government over a lengthy pay dispute. Here is Deji Batmus uh, with more on that story. Like every other government-owned university, the University of Lagos has been shot for close to a year. 
A 10-month strike over pay only ended in December. Students were looking forward to the resumption of classes. A union representing their lecturers is insisting the requisite COVID-19 protocols are put in place first. With the upsurge in the second wave of the coronavirus, uh, it is the conviction of our union that without putting in place necessary infrastructure, implementing the non-pharmaceutical aspect of the COVID-19 protocol, it will be suicidal to bring students back to campus. Particularly because not only are the classrooms overstretched, the hostels are overcrowded. Classrooms at the university have not been reorganized to allow for physical distancing. Hand washing facilities are hardly seen around. It's the same situation in the majority of public universities in the country. The aviation sector, immediately after the lockdown and flights were to start operation, you saw what was done at the airports. A lot of redesigning, a lot of reorganization with requisite funding from government. So I asked the question, why can't the same be done for universities? The university has now fixed its resumption date for January 25th, but for now, the authorities say learning will only take place virtually. It looks promising and I hope it's going to be okay. And we hope there will not be another strike like this because it's really tasking on the mental space of students and a lot of students have left in A lot of my friends actually have left in for private universities. Other universities in the country are also considering the virtual learning option. Of course, there are challenges with online learning here, but with the long closure of universities in the country, Many say waiting out the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic before learning can take place is really not an option. Dejabadmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Tunisia has begun a four-day general lockdown imposed to contain the spread of COVID-19. An already in-place curfew will now run from 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. Classes will be suspended for over a week. Tunisian authorities have urged the public to abide by the restrictions. The Minister of Health described the epidemiological situation in Tunisia as very dangerous. Fauzi Mahdi said the high number of deaths and the rapid spread of the virus led to a peak demand on hospitals. The infection rate is very high. The number of infections exceeded 160,000. It increased by 20,000 cases since December 31st. We increased the number of rapid tests at public hospitals and private laboratories. The daily average was 5,000 in December. Now it's 7,500 tests per day. We've launched a large-scale testing campaigns. The general lockdown is necessary. Tunisia's General Labour Union and the Confederation of Businesses urged the government to put in place some urgent measures for private sector workers and vulnerable groups the aim is to mitigate the repercussions of the general lockdown, which has paralyzed the economy. The government must help low-income groups and those who have been pushed into poverty during the pandemic. Authorities must say the truth to the people about the real economic indicators because the lockdown will have dire social and economic consequences. The National Observatory for New and Emerging Diseases revealed that the number of COVID-19-related deaths occurring at home is rising. It has reached 640 out of more than 5,500 fatalities recorded until January 15th. This rate is equivalent to 12% of the overall deaths since the outbreak of the pandemic. The food is more expensive during the lockdown. Medicines are not always available. Last year, we were supposed to stay at home for four days, but we were trapped for more than two months. I hope this won't happen again this time because we are suffering. The fresh COVID-19 restrictions also include banning cultural and sports events and weekly markets. In addition, authorities ordered removing shares and banning sitting in cafes and restaurants from January 18th. The Interior Ministry announced an increase in the number of fines and arrests due to COVID-19 rule breaching.
Health authorities assert that infections and deaths continue to soar in the North African country. Over 10,000 policemen and national guards have been deployed to enforce COVID-19 regulations during the general lockdown. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. And to Kenya and residents of Mombasa have hailed the opening of the Liwatoni floating bridge. The pedestrian bridge built by a Chinese company was officially opened for use on New Year's Day. The pontoon bridge is six meters wide and 840 meters long. It connects Mombasa Island to the southern coast of the mainland. The bridge complements existing ferry services that had a daily traffic volume of 300,000 pedestrians. Officials at the port say people are free to use either the bridge or the ferry. Many residents say it has eased the transport challenge at the Likoni crossing channel. This is a very straightforward way. You walk very comfortably. This is very close to our workplace. We are very happy because we can now use a shorter route. I am very thankful to the Chinese. I like their strong faith in doing excellent work. They should keep coming and we welcome them. I see this bridge, it is easier than the Nikoni ferry there. People, there is a lot of jam. As you see here, everybody's, everybody's just on his way. Nobody's scrambling people. Everybody's on his business. I do not convene at this bridge. Mm. I like it. You like it? I like it. All right, time now for our business segment. Let's hand it over to Uche. Thanks, Richard. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Ratings agency Moody's projects Ghana's GDP will grow by 4% this year. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden unveils a $1.9 trillion stimulus package proposal. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen? for yourself. If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. Business in Africa is high After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move, and it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiro Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain, or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is 
the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live, find your voice. Let's start off in Ghana. Ratings agency Moody's has predicted a gross domestic product growth rate of 4.4% rather for the country this year. The expected growth will place the country 10th on the African continent and third in West Africa. Now the projection comes after the World Bank forecast a 1.4% projection for Ghana under the 2021 Global Economic Prospects which was released last week. But of course, Moody says the shock from the COVID-19 pandemic, elevated liquidity threat, as well as weaker institutions and governance are the three key issues to be keenly watched this year. Well, still in West Africa, Nigeria's GDP is forecast to grow between 1.7% and 2% in 2021. This is largely predicated on an increase in economic activities and improving oil market conditions. Now, according to United Capital's report, the reopening of borders in the fourth quarter of 2020 should ease pressures on food prices. However, other structural factors such as FX market illiquidity and potential increases in petrol prices may keep general prices elevated. As a result, the headline inflation rate is expected to peak around 16% if no further policy adjustments are made. Meanwhile, the African continental free trade area kicked off earlier this month and Nigerian industrialists are hoping to get a piece of the pie. However, they need to ov overcome a myriad of challenges which are affecting manufacturing in the country, as Deji Badmus now reports. This textile factory in the Nigerian commercial city of Lagos is hoping to scale up production in the coming weeks to take advantage of the wider markets offered by the Africa Continental Free Trade Area after. But the operators fear the high cost of production in the country could work against their plans. It's a problem the main manufacturing body in the country acknowledges could cost local manufacturers from reaping the gains of the Continental Trade Initiative. There are... Uh Challenges for the manufacturing sector, which needs to be uh, overcome because before we are able to competitively engage in the uh, continental uh, free trade area. Government is certainly aware of this, and we are hoping that we will be able to uh, address those issues, even though manufacturers are also gearing up. Uh, we are retooling, we are um, trying to increase our capacities, and we look forward to an engaging interaction with our colleagues from other parts of Africa. Infrastructure challenges, high cost of funds and forex scarcity have for long been the bane of manufacturing in Nigeria. In recent times, the sector's contribution to the country's GDP has hardly exceeded 11%. But in spite of the challenges of Nigeria's manufacturing sector, advocates of the trade initiative say the country stands to benefit a lot from other sectors. If you take things like the financial services sector, for instance, our banking sector, many of them are already doing well around the continent. Our telecom sector, our ICT, e-commerce, our entertainment industry, the Nollywood, the fashion industry, and even the distributive trade sector is also part of services. So when you look at the services component of the economy, the opportunities are there and the challenges are not that much. In the context of AFCTA, we can have African countries buy our crude so that there is stability in our crude supply and, and things. That's one. We can also have these African countries buy refined products, petroleum products. So if we do refineries, we know that there are customers out there. So on both counts, they will bring stable foreign exchange revenue. 
and they, then stop all these distortions that we are having in our macroeconomic uh, uh, policy. Nigeria is home to about 50% of the estimated 90 million MSMEs in Africa. Experts believe the AFTA presents these local MSMEs a golden opportunity to expand their markets across the continent with ease and create much needed jobs in the process. So if everything works well and there are no major barriers to trade, that is a great opportunity for any entrepreneur. I know Nigerians are generally very entrepreneurial. So it's a great opportunity for investors in Nigeria to, to scale up their investments. The potential of the ATA on the Nigerian economy is indeed huge, but much work is still needed to get the country's manufacturing sector more functional so that local factories like this one are not thrown out of business under the weight of the stiff competition the initiative is sure to bring. Digibadmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. And heading to Egypt now, the country has signed a memorandum of understanding with Germany's Siemens for the construction of a $23 billion high-speed train line. Now, the project will kick off an initial 460-kilometer section running from Ain Sokna in the Red Sea to New Alamein on the Mediterranean coast. It will be passing through a new capital under construction in the desert east of Cairo. <laughs> We're talking about a project that will cost roughly 360 billion Egyptian pounds within two years. It will be built according to the highest scientific, technological and technical standards available. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This will be the spirit of Egypt. Fast, modern and always world-class negotiations. And to some international news now, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden has unveiled a $1.9 trillion economic relief package. Known as the American Rescue Plan, it includes a direct payments of $1,400 to most Americans and increasing the federal minimum wage to $15 per hour. The plan also includes $415 billion to fight the coronavirus. The bill also proposes to raise the federal per week unemployment benefit it to $400 and extending extending it through the end of September. This is the first of two major spending initiatives Biden will seek in the first few months of his presidency and comes as a winter surge of the coronavirus pandemic in the U.S. breaks records. Meanwhile, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden is also expected to take a different approach to immigration than the Trump administration. That includes making changes in the H-1B visa program. He has Mark New reporting. Even during the COVID pandemic, the digital economy has rapidly expanded, fueling an appetite for workers with computer science and engineering skills. But many tech industry executives say the Trump administration has tightened restrictions on the H-1B visa, stifling the pipeline of talent from abroad. It was a virtual wall that was built uh, with all these restrictions and uh, hurdles. As the CEO of a company offering credit cards for students, Kalpesh Kapadia says he's hired half a dozen employees on the H-1B. He has 120 U.S. employees, but says partly because of visa issues, he opened a second office in India with 40 staff, jobs that could have gone to the U.S. So I expect in the first six months of Biden administration, a lot of executive orders reversing some of these employee, employer, business unfriendly policies. Kapadia says one obstacle is a new Labor Department rule that raised the wage requirement for a number of high-tech jobs. In one example, that means companies would have to pay entry-level computer programmers on H-1Bs as much as 150% more. It's emotionally exhausting. Uh, and, you know, mentally you're checking in uh, every day on the H-1B website to see what has happened with your process and, you know, where is it stuck in the queue. Lawani is a senior product manager at Deserve on an H-1B, which he got transferred from another company. But that turned out to be a five-month process because the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services issued Lawani an RFE, or Request for Evidence. RFEs have gone way up under the Trump administration, and one major problem, Lawani says, is that his job title of product manager wasn't even listed in the specialty occupations. Because their roles are outdated and they don't even have the latest uh, you know, job descriptions, they have to literally go back and provide description around every course that they've taken in undergrad. You know, every course that they've taken in the master's degree, 
and every experience that they've had in different com- in different companies to show how this whole experience in education ties back to this new job description. President-elect Biden's website says he plans to exempt from any immigrant visa cap graduates of PhD programs in science, technology, engineering, and mathematic fields, and that foreign graduates of doctoral programs should be given a green card with their degree. Biden knows how important they are to the growth of innovation. It's kind of very interesting to me that three of the biggest tech companies we have are run by individuals who were born in India. I'm just hoping that with Biden administration, we can increase the transparency and all these certain changes would attract the right foreign talent, which would ultimately improve and scale innovation. Mark New, CGTN, San Jose, California. And of course, the U.S. and China have been locked in a tech battle over the last year, one that has expanded to even include a social media app. Here's a recap of what has happened so far. All they talked about is TikTok, 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 TikTok. TikTok is very successful. It does tremendous business in the United States. We're looking at TikTok. We may be banning TikTok. President Trump issued two executive orders on August 6, banning transactions with China's Tencent and ByteDance in 45 days on security concerns. We have to have the total security from China. ByteDance is the parent company of short video sharing app TikTok, while Tencent owns the social media app WeChat. Those popular apps must switch to American ownership to keep operating in the U.S. We are looking at a lot of alternatives with respect to TikTok. Whether it's uh, Microsoft or somebody else. Walmart is going to buy it along with Oracle. I think it's going to be a fantastic deal. But so far, no deal at all. The Microsoft bid was turned down. Oracle and Walmart are still waiting for answers from U.S. regulators. Their proposal, according to ByteDance, was to take only 20% shares in a new venture called TikTok Global instead of a buyout. In fact, TikTok and WeChat were neither sold nor banned even after their reprieves expired. U.S. District Court Judge Carl Nichols put a pause on the Trump administration's move, granting TikTok an injunction it had filed against the order. The same thing happened for WeChat. A North Carolina judge believed there was hardly any evidence that a ban on WeChat would address U.S. national security concerns. However, Huawei didn't get so lucky. After fighting for nearly two years, the Chinese telecom giant was officially cut off from all of its core chip suppliers on September 15th. Washington claims, without offering evidence, that the company's equipment could be used for spying. And these latest restrictions have been applied to stop Huawei getting around existing sanctions by sourcing its components from third parties. To preserve the Honor smartphone line, Huawei sold the entire unit to another Chinese IT company in two months. The tech war did not stop there. The Trump administration added dozens of Chinese tech companies to its entity list, including chipmaker SMIC and Joan manufacturer DJI. The U.S. government has also appealed a judge's order blocking restrictions on TikTok. Some say the moves are just the outgoing president's last attempt to cement his legacy as a hardliner against China. And that's where we'll leave it on Africa Live Biz, but still to come on Global Business Africa. South Africans are urging the government to secure coronavirus vaccines fast, as of course the nation battles with a second wave. Of course, all that coming up at top of the hour. For now, it is back to Uche. Thank you so much, Uche. We are not done just yet. Keep it right here. We've got your sports news coming up. Here's a peek at the headline. All set for a delayed 2020 African Nations Championship in Cameroon.